The enemy will try to divide us from our scholars who are righteous and pious and knowledgeable. Because once you do that, you can use a plethora of tools. So many things have been used to relative success to make scholars less reliable in the eyes of the community. And ultimately, people will start to resent them. They'll say things like, well, these maraja, these scholars, they're not infallible at the end of the day. So why listen to them if they're not infallible? Well, nobody claimed that they were infallible. They are the closest resemblance we have to the righteous companions of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. No one can or should compare them to the Ahlul Bayt. They're not on par with the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Nowhere near them, in fact. But they're the best we got. They're experts who have put in the time, the effort, the energy, their entire lives in acquiring the sciences of religion in order to teach us and to guide us. So this is a fallacy that we are not going to accept. They're not infallible, of course they're not. But they are the best option we have right now until the return of the Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. That's one thing you hear. The other thing you hear is all these allegations about financial corruption and whatnot. Which may or may not be true. But ultimately, when it comes to any allegation, it has to be number one, substantiated. It has to be proven. You can't just say, oh, but I saw someone in some fancy car and so he must have taken this, he must have used funds from the you know, public funds, from homes and whatnot, in order to enrich himself. How do you know? How do you know he didn't inherit some money? But does he have to be poor? So you accept him and you validate him as a scholar? How do you know someone didn't just gift it to him? Many scholars have people who admire them and love them and respect them. And this is a good thing. Here, you don't have a house, here's a house. You don't have a car, here's a car. People who are very wealthy and willing to help and support the ulama. How do you know these things? Besides, let's say there are a few bad apples out there. I was just talking about bad apples. <laughs> I was just saying that we have people who are not righteous. But this doesn't negate the fact that we have no other choice but to resort to our scholars. Meaning that if you have one or two or ten individuals who might not be the most, you know, the greatest examples, right? But how does that translate into we must distrust all of the ulama? Do you not have doctors and professionals and engineers and whatnot? who are bad and corrupt. Of course you do. But that doesn't mean that you mistrust the entire medical system because one doctor was a fraudster. Because one doctor, every once in a while you hear this in the news. They found a doctor who was sexually abusing his patients. You found a doctor who was, you know, organ harvesting and doctors do this and doctors do that. So what? It doesn't mean that doctors as a community of experts should be thrown out the window because someone did something. But these are all demonic means that are being used to sow seeds of doubt among the, among the community against the ulama. Be very careful. Once you divide the ulama from the community, the community is lost. Again, as I said, you have to take the most senior ulama as your source of emulation. Not your speakers, not your reciters. Or much worse, performers and imposters, entertainers. The day speakers and reciters, even good ones, the day they're taking as our, taken as our source of emulation. And the barometer for what is right and wrong is a day we have to sit down and cry because we're done. Instead, we emulate the senior ulama, the scholars who have been verified and checked out.